Hello everybody and welcome to Nutrition Care Plan and ADIMES. This is part of Unit 4, either the first or second lecture depending on which order you decide to do it. It'll work either way. So we're talking about care plans to, uh, well I'll say today, but at whatever point it is you're watching this. Uh, care plans aren't unique to nutrition care. Almost every healthcare discipline uses some form of care plan. And the reason is because it's good, actually. I, don't know. I feel like a lot of times people come in and rag on these kind of things. No, no, I, I actually think the care plan model is, is a pretty good scheme to use for uh, planning care and interventions. So the care plan consists of answering four basic questions. Question one is, what problem does the patient have? Um, question two is, how are you going to fix it? Question three is, how are you going to know it's fixed? And question four is, how are you going to know if it returns or not? Four questions. And it's a good organizational system. Now, the nutrition care plan is essentially your uh, assessment of patient's condition and your plans to address them. It's important to be clear and concise on this. My thought experiment, my practice scenario, if you will, for interns is imagine you have the doctor in front of you. She has a big caseload today. She's kind of impatient. She's ready to go. She's looking at her watch while she's watching you. You've got like 90 seconds to win her over to your standpoint on something. How are you going to convince her that your intervention is the right plan? How are you going to win her over? This is your chance to make everything known about the patient you want her to know. When you do this, um, when you're writing out a care plan, I should say, it's important to always remember that you note what you say, what the patient says, what you're going to do, and how the patient feels about your plan. So, for example, you're going to that you talk to them about carbohydrate, consistent carbohydrate intake. The patient is um, on is okay with this, but they're a little hesitant and kind of nervous. So you're gonna note that the patient has some concerns. What you're going to do, say you're going to provide some nutrition counseling in uh, three times a week for the next two weeks. And how does the patient feel about your plan? Do they are, uh, they voiced understanding and agreement. They are not, um, they don't want to do it. That's that's fine to note that. Um, you know, you can actually note if you offer nutrition counseling and they just say no, they shut you down. That's okay. Note what the patient said. Um, an important thing about this, right, is obviously make sure you do all those steps, part one, and then write down what happened. Also remember that this is, the chart is a, not just a, not only is it a medical document, it's a legal document. So make sure to be honest and clear about what's in there. But also remember that if it's not written down, it didn't happen. You can't go back and say, oh, well, I completely talked to Miss Abercrombie last, uh, you know, this, early, this past Monday. Uh, it doesn't matter. If it's not in the chart, it didn't occur. It doesn't count. So remember to write down everything and be thorough about what you write down. Okay, let's talk about the A-dime. Uh, what is the A-dime? The ADIME is a version of the nutrition care plan. It's not the only version of, or the only way to do a nutrition care plan. It is the Academy's preferred method of dietetic charting, and it is the one I teach. Partially because it's the one the Academy likes, and partially because I can say for a fact that federal and state surveyors, federal surveyors for sure, and state surveyors in the state of Texas, they know to look for this. They are specifically taught in guidance to look for the ADIME and very specifically for the PES statement. An important reason to do it right now acutely is when you do the next, when you do your case study and the unit four assignment, I am going to expect a PES. It's the only documented, or the only particular formatting I want in anything is I'm going to look for a PES. So very quickly, what is the ADIME? The ADIME is um, made of five sections. It's not just a 
fun little word. It's you know obviously not, it's an acronym. The A is for the assessments, which is what does the patient look like, what did they say or do, what labs do you have, what's their diet order, what's their estimated needs. The D is for diagnosis, um, also called the PES statement or the PEZ statement. Uh, sometimes it's called the nutrition diagnosis. All of these are the same thing. It's the, di- the nutrition diagnosis. The intervention, I'm sorry, also back up real quickly. Nutrition diagnosis answers part one. I'm sorry, I got to point that way. The nutrition diagnosis answers part one of the question of the care plan, which is what is the problem? That's the nutrition diagnosis. The intervention is the next part, which is what are you going to do about it? You know, what, what is your plan for this? Uh, that answers that question. You know, I've, I, I've identified the problem. This is what I intend to do about the problem. Part three is monitor, uh, which is, remember, how are we going to know that either the, the intervention has worked or we have to declare the intervention as a failure and try something else? And it's fine. I, I think there's sometimes a concern that you shouldn't declare an intervention a failure. It, it's fine. Not every intervention works with every patient. It's completely okay to say, I tried this. It did not work. This is what I'm going to try now. So don't don't feel like this is some sort of failure on your part if the intervention did not work. It just may not. And the final one is... If, um, I'm sorry, back up here for a second. Monitor is how we're going to know it's working on something. It's working, as I said earlier. Um, and then evaluation is how are you going to determine success long-term and how are you going to determine if the problem has recurred? So, for example, say you have someone who's underweight and your diagnosis is unintentional weight loss, which has led to them being underweight. Your intervention may be high calorie, high protein supplements in between meals three times a week. And you can or cannot, it depends a bit on the setting, if you want to set a timeline for this, how long do you want to do it, or are you just going to kind of do it indefinitely and, and, and monitor. So the monitoring is um, how, what are we going to look for to determine that the uh, intervention was successful. Well, we're going to look at the patient's weight. We're going to monitor weight. If the weight at least stabilizes, if they were actively losing weight and they were underweight, if the mon- if the if their weight at least stabilizes, we can make it at least declare a partial success. Ideally, they start to gain a little bit of weight over time. That would be better. But that's how we're going to monitor the weight or monitor the weight monitor the uh, intervention is we're going to assess weight. How are we going to know if the intervention recurs? By monitoring the weight still. If their weight starts to dip again, especially if it goes into unhealthy, underweight status, that will re-trigger the care plan. Or if it never, going back to this, let's look at the bad side of this, if their weight never, if if they continue to lose weight or stay underweight, we're going to determine that that intervention was not successful and we're going to try something else. High protein, high calorie diet. Um, Maybe they need an alteration in consistency. Maybe they need a speech assessment done. There are other, there are other alternatives. There's other interventions to pull out. That was just an example off the top of my head. Okay. So a little bit more in depth here. Um, the assessment is what is going on with the patient. Remember to include subjective and objective information in this. Remember anything as a clinician that you see that makes you go, hmm, it's worth at least noting. Include subjective and objective information. Remember the ABCD. This is the foundation for your entire course of care. This setup is going to determine everything else that you do and any other practitioner does following you. So it's important to be very clear and very careful on this section. Uh, really quickly here, we're also going to discuss those soap notes, which confusingly can be their own thing, or they can be part of the assessment. And so soap can be its own schematic, its own way of writing out a note. It can also be used inside the assessment. SOAP is, um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Was it? So remember, it can be a narrative SOAP format. 
It can be bullet points in your assessment. It can be a narrative. It could be a, um, a form that you fill out that you tick radials in. Any of those are completely possible. The important thing is to be sure to include patients' observations, thoughts, whether they understand and agree to your intervention plan or not. And again, remember, anything in this section is fine. What's important is to be a clear documentarian of what's going on. So if they tell you to take a hike, you know, kick rocks and get out, that, that's okay. Like, this is what I saw. This is what I said. This is what the patient said to me. I'll circle around and try again later. Or maybe if you have a team, I'm going to send somebody else because I'm clearly not effectively communicating with this person. That, both of those are fine. Okay, so the subformat is subjective, objective, plan, uh, blah, I can't spell soap. Subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. Again, very quickly, you know, subjective is symptoms. What does the patient look like to you? How do they feel? What do you see? Anything that they can tell you about their, their, their situation or what you can see is part of subjective. Objective is um, signs, say anything measurable. Remember, signs, status, symbol, uh, status symbols? No. Status of the patient vitals. Uh, also, in objective, uh, often is who else was there. It's important to note that for, case, for the assessment. If they have, um, say, spouse was in the room with them, that's important to note. Um, but anything, again, any, any facts of the case that can be measured go in objective. The assessment in a SOAP note is similar to the nutrition diagnosis. What do you think is happening? What do you believe is going on? And the plan is the IME part of ADIME, which is what are you going to do about it? And this is actually why I prefer the ADIME to the SOAP, because I feel that this is much clearer in the whole approach, in your approach, setting it out for other people to see. Right? And to me, at least, writing out my approach helps me to think about how I'm going to do it. It helps me formulate a plan. Okay. Diagnosis. Um, we are going to do PES statements in this class. It's the one format I actually do require. So for the final case study, the Nutrition Care Plan Project, and for the Unit 4 case study, I am expecting to find a PES statement. And the reason I'm doing that is twofold, because it is a universal standard, and it's becoming recognized in the healthcare community as the dietitian's formal assessment of what's going on. This is the declaration that they're, that other groups are looking for, they know to look for. And again, this is what inspectors know to look for. Because it's such a formalized statement and it has very, very rigid language to it, everybody knows what to look for and everybody is looking for it. So we're going to go over how to do the PES. Um, I guess feel free to tune out for a minute if you feel like you got this, but we're going to go over how to do PES statements in long-term care. It's important to remember that the format that everybody knows and is looking for is uh, a thingy, which is the problem in the PES statement related to, you know, yada, yada. Now, this is etiology. This is what is, this can either be what's causing the problem or what is, is what, what triggers you to see it? And then as evidenced by whatever is, this is what's leading me to support the idea of this problem. So really quickly, for example, we could do, um, well, we'll have some examples in a second. We don't need to give you any more examples. You, we have examples coming, don't worry. Be right back. So these are some common ones that I do in long-term care frequently. Uh, probably the most common one is Inability to follow nutrition-related recommendations. Often it's related to dementia. As evidenced by the person is not oriented to time or place, and they have some uh, odd behaviors. This is what's leading me to believe dementia is a cause for their being unable to follow nutrition-related recommendations. Another common one is increased protein energy needs. Now, also, by the way, you've probably seen here, I use a lot of shorthand and uh, 
kind of choppy writing when I do this. That's that that's more of a stylistic choice than anything else. I'm just a lazy typist and I don't want to write it out. So I do a lot of this shorthand. Don't feel like you have to. If you'd like to write full, complete sentences and it helps you think better, by all means, go ahead. That's not That aspect is not important to the PES. Do what makes you feel comfortable there. So I'm sorry, go back to this now. Okay, increased, they're having increased protein energy needs related to a wound status. And this is evidenced by the estimated needs. So I calculated in this case their estimated needs based on wound healing and that caused more that caused a greater need for the patient than they would have in a normal circumstance uh there are other ways to do this one too it doesn't have to be there's not one right way particularly to make especially the uh evidence you could say as evidenced by the npiap recommendations as evidenced by increased uh activity factors in the mifflin st jor all of those would be legitimately fine uh, another one is uh, often inadequate oral food beverage intake related to, in this case, anorexia and dyskusia, as evidenced by PO intake not meeting estimated needs. In this case, someone's not eating enough because they're experiencing anorexia and dyskusia, so they're not hungry, things don't taste good, and this is evidenced by their PO intake not meeting estimated needs. A couple more here. Difficulty chewing related to poor denture fit as evidenced by patients' statements statements, statements, and decreased PO intake. So again, breaking this down, they're having a difficult time chewing. It's related to poor denture fit. And the reason I know this is because they, a, they have um, decreased intake and also because in this case, the patient told me these don't fit. And that, there's probably not a better piece of evidence than that. Overweight or obesity related to increased or excess energy intake and lack of physical activity as evidenced by their BMI. So in this case, I'm just saying, you know, this person is obese, say, and the reason that I think they're obese is because of, um, not that, let me say it this way, uh, they're obese the reason they, they have developed obesity is because they have increased or have excess energy intake and they have no physical activity to speak of. And the reason that I think this is, that I think they are obese is because their BMI is high. Another one I use a lot is no PES at this time. This is how I usually phrase it. Uh, some people say none. There actually is a code for no PES. I believe it's N-O, I think it's N-O-1.1. I think that doesn't matter. Um, but the uh, important thing is like, so in long-term care, this is actually a pretty good statement. Like this is positive because our goal in long-term care is to get people to a point of stability and comfort. This, this is a good sign. I wouldn't recommend it. If you are going into the internship, I wouldn't recommend this in, in most other situations because there's almost always something else going on. Okay, so we've done the nutrition diagnosis. So the intervention question, again, is what are you going to do about this, right? You've identified the problem, and then part, the next part of this is, and this is how I'm going to address that problem. It should be practical, meaningful, and relevant. Do your best to make sure it's possible. Um, you don't want to just... You don't want to promise the moon and stars. You want to actually have a plan with something you can act you can feasibly have happen. Also, though, it's really important to remember, don't get locked up so much on make sure it's possible that you don't do anything. I, I can't think of a worse situation for a clinician to put themselves into than to identify a problem and then not address it. Do something. <laughs> so make sure you are addressing it in some way. Remember, even if you have a little bit of suspicion that this may not work, it's okay to try something. It's better to try something and then come back and say, that didn't work, let's try something else, as opposed to just not addressing it at all. Make sure when you've done an intervention or when you've come up with intervention that you talk about it with the patient and report their thoughts. How do they feel about it? Um, 
remember from the last time, the most important or the, the best therapy, the most practical therapy, therapeutic intervention you can do is the one they're actually going to cooperate with, the one that they're willing to do. So make sure you get their thoughts on how they feel about this and get by it. Do your best to convince them that this is the best choice. And honestly, if you flat can't get buy-in, do another intervention. Come up with something else. Also note there, when you if you can't get buy-in, note that you tried and that they, they wouldn't agree. Again, there's nothing wrong with saying, I think this is the best course, patient was not agreeable, so we're going to try this instead first. Then that's okay, because this, the patient has ultimate um, choice in the matter. They are the final so they have the final say. They have freedom to be involved in treatments and make their own medical choices. They don't always do what you want them to do. So the fact that you tried at least is something that you can both use in the future when you talk to them and also to protect you professionally, ethically, and clinically. Okay. Monitoring and evaluation. Uh, again, what are you going what are you going to watch? to see if your intervention worked or not. Um, also, when will you declare success? So monitoring and evaluation here, I've combined them. We're answering two questions and actually kind of a third as well, which is uh, what are you going to look at to see if your intervention worked or not? Remember in that previous example of someone who's underweight, what we're going to be watching is their weight status. Does it, are they losing weight? Has their weight stabilized? Hopefully, has their weight started to go up a little bit? When will you declare a success? When are you going to determine that your intervention worked or didn't? And in nutrition, and for, uh, blah. In a nutrition intervention, I think a lot of times it's easier or it's more common to not have an end date on something. It's This is more to say, this didn't work than to say, neat, we're done. We're not going to worry about this anymore. If, for example, on this person, again, we were talking about our, our imaginary person who's losing weight. If they started gaining weight, I'm probably not going to stop what they were doing for some time. At the very least, I want to get them back up to a healthy weight. That would be the earliest I would consider taking it, you know, stopping an intervention. I'd probably let it ride for a while in a the, in the long-term care setting. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, uh, what are you going to do also if... Uh, this situation arises again. When will you look at the data and say, oh, this problem has developed again. Time to interact. Interact? No. Time to activate a new intervention. So really quickly here, um, can you stack PESs? Uh, this is a debate. It's a, not a fierce debate by any stretch. It's more of a stylistic choice, I think. Uh, so the issue here is that some uh, dietitians prefer to choose the most important problem among problems or the one that they feel they can address and focus on that. Some list multiple PESs, maybe one for each issue, and that is what I like to do with this. I call it stacking. Uh, there is no official term for it as far as I'm aware. There's no official word from the academy on this. So really quickly, how to stack PESs. Like I said, I, I like to do that. I think it's fine to say there's multiple issues. I'm going to do my best to address all of them. Uh, so how to stack them. If, um, say, we have three problems, they interrelate, make PESs for all of them. And in this example, we'll have inability to follow nutrition-related recommendations, inadequate intake related to the inability, and unintentional weight loss. When you stack... Or when I when I stack, I either go by primary, secondary, or tertiary. In that first example, the problem here was that they have an inability to adhere to recommendations, which has caused them to lose weight, and has made it unlikely that they'll be able to do, to do active interventions in the future. You can also cause by prime um, by most immediate, secondary. Remember Owen's triage dictum there you can address it by this is the most important issue right now. Um, let's, let's look at somebody who is maybe say lost weight. They have, say they have involuntary weight loss. They also have a wound. So they have increased needs. 
And um, so they have weight loss, they have wounds, and they're confused. So you could argue at this point that you're going to do the primary one, which is everything at this point is related to, I would argue, weight loss, or sorry, wounds. Wound status is what's leading to everything else. You could, and then build them that way. You could also say the core problem here is that they have an inability to adhere to recommendations. Therefore, they have developed a wound from not being able to move, having poor nutrition, having, and that's going, that causes an increase in needs. There's more than one way to do this, as you can see. So remember Owen's triage dictum? Remember Hickam's dictum? They can have as many problems as they feel like. So one, three, five, who knows? I wouldn't probably go that high. That's plenty to deal with, but you know, I've, I have gone up to three uh, definitely in the past. All right, that is, um, I just blanked, that is uh, the ADIME and nutrition care planning. And I'll catch you for a little bit more on facilities and regulation. Y'all have a good one. Bye.